So my relationship with disruption started very early. In fact, I was seven years old when I got handed my first set of lines. I must not disrupt the class. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I'd arrived in Australia a few weeks earlier. I couldn't speak a word of English. I didn't understand anything that was happening around me. But I was innovative. I found two girls in the class that spoke fluent Italian and English. And so, of course, I sat with them at every lesson and got them to do a bit of simultaneous interpreting. But I kept getting the lines because I guess my learning style was not really accepted by the teachers and they thought that I was bothering people rather than I was just doing what I needed to do to learn something. This story is very typical of not just me, but many children of immigrants. Over the years, I've met lots of people like myself whose parents made the decision to migrate to Australia. And, you know, through no fault of our own, we were landed in this new country, learning a new language and trying to make our way in a completely new paradigm. So that was my story. Fast forward 30 years later, and I meet this beautiful boy, Jordan. He had just arrived from Italy. And guess what? He couldn't speak a word of English either. And you know what? He had the same problems. He was regarded as disruptive. He was told that he should probably leave school. And it was only by the grace of God that his mother had met a guy called Reverend Bill Cruz that provided a literacy program that enabled Jordan to live a full and productive life. Sadly, on the, in December 2013, Jordan passed away in his sleep. He died of an aneurysm. But what I know is that the remaining years of his life were productive. He didn't feel stupid. He felt like he could work and that he was a smart person. I would have been devastated if Jordan had passed away before he got that gift of being able to feel like he was contributing to society. Jordan had a huge impact on my life because until I met Jordan, I'd spent 30 years working in government, NGOs and for ministers, both sides of politics, Labor and Liberal. And I left myself really feeling very frustrated and really upset. And the reason being is I just don't think what we're doing to vulnerable people in this country is good enough. And I thought that by working for ministers or working for big NGOs or working for the government departments that actually serve these people, I could have a really huge impact. I was wrong. I didn't have a huge impact. There was always a resistance to doing things differently. And I got fessed up with the status quo every single day in the 30 years wherever I worked. And I just felt that the status quo was not good enough. I thought the status quo was unacceptable. Do you know that in Australia we spend $250 billion a year on social disadvantage? The same year, the Australian Council of Social Services found one in seven adults and one in six kids living below the poverty line. This is unacceptable. This is the flip side of the business of tomorrow. 3.6 billion people underemployed and unemployed around the world. What shocked me about this figure, this is from the International Labour Organisation, is that 2 billion of these people have actually given up looking for work. And before you get excited and say, oh yes, but Australia, we're the lucky country, and we are. In Australia, we have 800,000 people on disability support pension and another 600,000 people on unemployment benefits. That's 1.4 million people falling through the cracks of progress. And that worries me. So when we talk about the business of tomorrow, I'm in two minds. Part of me is so excited about automation and technology and artificial intelligence and the future that might actually free up humans to be more creative. But the other side of me has this deep sense of anxiety about the people that will fall through the cracks. And I personally don't want the business of tomorrow not to be human-centred. I think that's a grave mistake. So I do have a lot of optimism, though. There's a futurist called Gerd Leonard who coined the phrase that we're going from ecosystem 
to ecosystem. So ecosystem is where we just think of ourselves. Like it's just me, how things affect me. Ecosystem is we acknowledge that we're all interconnected, that we're all part of something. So a company that plonks itself in the middle of a town is part of that community as well. Surely they're not just there to make profit, but they also have to give something back. And that's where the idea of a social license comes in. Social license has been used in the resources sector for a long, long time. And it means that when somebody's buying, say, a big farm or when somebody's wanting to mine a particular area, they have to get the acceptance of the community. They have to compel or convince the community that they're not just there for profit over people, that they're going to leave something behind for that community to prosper also from the work that they've done. And I think maybe that's the sort of thing that we need to think about when we're talking about the business of tomorrow. Because I don't want to see people falling through cracks. And I think that there are some great examples out there. Accenture is one example. Now Accenture is a really massive company. It employs over 300,000 people globally. And a couple of years ago, I think maybe it was last year, they deleted 17,000 jobs that were removed through automation and technology. But what they did is they had a social license. They decided that they were going to work on those 17,000 people and reskill them and redeploy them across the business. Now I accept that not every company can do that, but I'm sure glad that Accenture did. And part of me thinks, could you imagine if they just let go of 17,000 people, what the community would think of that? I actually don't think it would work so well because I think that stakeholders, your shareholders, your local community, your staff and your customers actually do care if you do or don't care about people. And so this actually gives me a bit of optimism. There's also another futurist, a guy called Jeremy Scrivens, who works out of Victoria in Australia. And he is being called on by executives around the world, including um, some people from the National Health Service in the UK. And these top executives are calling this guy and saying to him, we want to reconnect with our staff, with our customers and local communities. So these big corporations and government agencies are realising that they're part of something. They're not just living in isolation, doing what they want. They have to fit in to an interconnected ecosystem. And that is really promising for me. But you may or may not know, a couple of weeks ago, we had another groundbreaking thing that happened in Australia. We had the first ever accord between Unions New South Wales and Airtasker, a startup. That, to me, is the business of tomorrow. The business of tomorrow is cognizant about people's lives. It realises that it has an impact on people, on humans. And what excited me about this is I was privileged to have met Tim Fung, who's one of the co-founders of Airtasker, and I rang him last week and I said, I'm doing this TEDx talk. Can you tell me what happened with that accord? I want to know how it came about and why you agreed to do it. And he said, essentially, Unions New South Wales, which represents the interests of workers, basically, they wrote a report on the gig economy. They weren't apologetic that businesses like Airtasker, Freelancer and many others are actually diminishing wages and conditions. Now, Tim Fung and his team were actually horrified because a company like Airtasker, in fact, does not set the wages. That's what the market will bear. But instead of abrogating that responsibility and saying, oh, well, it will pass, they approached Unions New South Wales and they said, how can we work this out? We actually do. Airtasker as a business does care about people. They care about their workers and they don't want them to be uh, not treated well or their wages diminished. So this was something that two entities that could have ignored each other and just kept whinging at each other, actually collaborated and they decided on forming an accord. What this means is that all the people that are on the Airtasker platform, we will, will have some safety and some provisions. 
Now, I'm not saying it's going to be perfect and I don't know the details of it. I think they're still working it out as well. But to me, that's a business of tomorrow, a business that cares about what a union might say, that we might be inadvertently diminishing the rights of our workers. And I don't think anybody really wants to do that. But that's two examples of two companies that have self-regulated. They've made the decision, without a social licence being imposed on them, they've made the decision that it's important to be part of something that is whole. And that is really, to me, what the business of tomorrow is. This is Anna and Narari. They're here in the audience today. I met Anna and Narari at a hackathon myself, Annie Parker and Nicole Williamson held in Liverpool in November 2015. It's called Techfugees Australia. And Techfugees Australia is a hackathon that was founded in the UK by the editor of TechCrunch, a guy called Mike Butcher, in response to the refugee crisis globally. He brought the tech community to work with refugees and find solutions to the refugee crisis. Within a couple of days of him announcing that hackathon, Annie Parker, here in Australia, basically put out one tweet. And that tweet attracted myself and Nicole Williamson, and we jumped on board, and the rest is history. Now, Anna and Narari met at that hackathon because I was really passionate about making the hackathon a co-design. I didn't want the refugees just to be passive observers of a process where we were going to find out the problem and we were going to solve it for them like we've done from the year dot. So what was really exciting is Narari got to share his story. And I apologise in advance if I start to fall apart because I can't tell this story without really thinking about humanity and human lives. Narari, at the date that we held that first hackathon in Liverpool, had been in Australia for six months. He was a very newly arrived refugee. And he shared his story, which was compelling. He stood there and he said, I was a lecturer in IT in Syria. I've got 10 years experience in IT, yet I cannot get my foot in the door here in Australia. And it was devastating. He met Anna at that hackathon and Anna was very familiar with that story because Anna had worked on Nauru, which is a refugee centre, and she had seen the enormous number of skilled refugees desperate to get, get themselves together and be able to start a life in their new country. Now, what happened was Anna and Narari started a business called Refugee Talent. And essentially, what that business does is it brings the opportunity to skilled refugees and matches them with employers that are looking for those skills. Now, it's not really that hard but within a couple of years, Narari is now a refugee that's been in Australia for under two years. He's a tech co-founder and speaking at conferences around the world. Him and Anna were featured in Forbes 30 Under 30 um, top business leaders. Now, that is the reason why the business of tomorrow has to be human-centred. This is the example of human-centred business someone who solves a problem from the shared or lived experience. No one did anything to Narari. He designed the solution with the support of Anna. And he solved a problem that I can tell you in my 30 years of government and NGO, nobody has been able to solve that problem in 30 years. And here is a newly arrived refugee who, bang, solves that problem. And I'm not saying it's solved, solved, but here's the thing. Do you know there's 170 businesses and government departments on the refugee talent platform? That, to me, is extraordinary. These guys have only been in existence for under two years, and they've already got 150 businesses saying, we want to connect with skilled refugees. Then something else happened. A lot of migrants who have come to this country that are skilled, like my mother, my mother was a teacher, and she came to Australia. I grew up thinking my mother was a very professional woman. She ended up working three jobs, being a factory worker when she arrived in Australia. Because guess what? Her qualifications weren't recognised. So fast forward 30 years, and here's Narari, a newly arrived refugee himself, who solves a problem that has not been solved in 30 years. 
This, to me, is the business of tomorrow. It has a massive social heart and it does concern itself about people. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. There is one more thing that I did want to share with you and that is that Gavin Heaton is a friend of mine and we've been working on another solution. Remember the 1.4 million Australians that are languishing on unemployment benefits and disability support pension? Well, we've designed a platform called Works For Me. The reason we've designed this is we felt that what people needed was a pre-employment platform. People need to connect to the work experience, to the training, and also to the internships and work experience that they otherwise wouldn't have. And what we felt is that we don't want to see those people falling through the cracks of progress in the future. It's important that we take people along with us. So, I must not disrupt the class. Aren't you glad that I kept disrupting that goddamn class and that I kept disrupting everything that I was a part of? Not to, not to do it in a bad way, but you see, Jordan had a profound impact on my life. What he taught me is that life can, can turn at the flip of a coin. Life is really fragile. And what he gave me was the courage to say what needs to be said. He has given me the courage to stand here before you today and to tell you that without a human centre, the business of tomorrow is really not something any of us want to see. That the business of tomorrow has a huge social heart. The business of tomorrow is collaborative, it's expansive, it's inclusive. And the business of tomorrow does not leave people behind. And really in the vein of, I guess, the spirit of self-determination, what I'm here to tell you is it's up to you and me. It's up to us. Because I don't trust that everyone's going to self-regulate in this new, brave new world. And I don't really want government to regulate. But I think if all of us call people to account and stand there and say things like, Are we, if we're going to lose all these jobs, make sure, let's make sure we have something to replace it, that is the business thinking of tomorrow. So I hope that you also will take something out of this and you will disrupt whatever you need to disrupt and that you will remember that progress is not progress if we leave people behind. So let's take them with us. Thank you.